Welcome back! Today we are going to be heading out to a very special place, actually two very special places. So let's go ahead and pack up our gear and hit the road. stop through this really small hidden cafe and it's kind of ironic because the name of the cafe is Hidden Cafe. Got myself a really good coffee for like 65 bucks. They let me fly my drone so that was really cool. So I just got here to Hell's Fire Pass. This is a place that I've been wanting to see for forever. You've probably seen it in tons of different movies and documentaries and stuff if you're a World War II junkie like me. But this is the place where tons and tons and tons of guys died. It was probably one of the most crucial and difficult parts of the journey that the men back in World War II worked. And it, it was absolutely brutal, the conditions that they had. But something to understand first is that when they first set out on this journey, they were stuck down in Singapore uh, and they were surrounded by the Japanese. They didn't believe that they were going to be overtaken in Singapore because it was like this gigantic fortress. But they didn't count on one thing, which was the Japanese cutting through the jungle to attack Singapore. So <clears throat> the Japanese cut through the jungle. They started overtaking Singapore, and to the best of my knowledge, I believe it was General Patton, the guy who had the, the pearl-handled pistols, and he was down there in Singapore with these guys when they were getting attacked by the Japanese. President Eisenhower, he was the guy that came after Teddy Roosevelt, he ordered General Patton to leave and leave all of his men in Singapore. Patton knew that the Japanese had not signed the Geneva Convention 10 years earlier, and so he was like, we're not going to surrender. Eisenhower was ordering him. He's like, tell your men to surrender, and but you have to take off first. And Patton said, no, I'm not going to leave my men behind. I'm not going to leave them. You need to send reinforcements. Eisenhower agrees to send reinforcements under the condition that Patton leaves. So Patton packed up his family and he took off on a boat. And then Eisenhower ordered the surrender of the troops. So the troops surrender. And the Japanese, they, they viewed surrender as like this ultimate humiliation. And they also thought that they were more evolved than us, thought that their emperor was like a god almost of some sorts. Uh, they were really, really pretty sick back then, pretty sick people. And they had been uh, torturing and conquering and doing their own forms of concentration camps in all of Asia, all the surrounding countries for hundreds of years, actually. So when the Allied forces surrendered, the Japanese, they weren't treating them too well, but they were at least in relatively okay conditions for the most part down in Singapore. Now, the Japanese told them, we're going to send you somewhere where you can wait out the war and you're going to be in a much better place. It's going to be more comfortable for you. And so all the allied forces were like, okay, well, that sounds great. So the Japanese packed them into literally these cars right behind me. And this is, I'm outside the museum right now and they got these train cars here and they shipped them from Singapore all the way up through Malaysia, all the way up through Thailand into Kanchanaburi, which is on like the Midwestern part of Thailand. And as you can see from these train cars, they were pretty packed. They didn't have any food, any water. There were no bathrooms. They didn't stop for any bathroom breaks or anything like that. They didn't even have any ventilation shafts except for these really, really small holes right here. 
And what's really interesting is you can see over on this car that this was this was chiseled out here. And my guess was it was probably the troops when they were on their way down, they wanted to see their way out. So they chiseled a hole here, it looks like, and it looks like they chiseled all of this. But this was literally the only ventilation that they had and the only light. And I think their trip was for like three or four days. No food, no water, train cars completely packed. And uh, next to no light and no air sweating and if you've ever been to Southeast Asia I mean you know how hot it gets and being in these metal train cars they would just soak up the heat so it was pretty brutal but we're gonna go inside the museum here and check it out so let's go standing here at the beginning of the museum and uh, the Australian government has put this together and they did a really good job but you can see behind me these are the names of all the men that died making this pass and it's truly amazing there's a story a movie actually called the railway man and it's on Netflix and this is a picture of the man behind me if you can see it uh, walking down Hell's Fire Pass I believe probably uh, I want to say it was like 40 years or 50 years after he was a prisoner here. So you can see behind me here, this is a example given of how many rocks each prisoner was meant to carry every day compared to the amount of rice that they were given down there. Alright guys, well I'm getting ready to start the trail here. What's really cool is that they give you a free audio tour and now that COVID's going on they give you a free set of iPhone headphones too that you get to keep so that's kind of cool and it's all free so that's really awesome but let's go ahead and check out the trail I'm really excited for this let's go because it's such a huge, huge part of World War II. You can see behind me here, this is a little memorial. Uh, if I can get a little closer, here's some of the actual tools that they used when uh, trying to get through this. That's pretty incredible because you can actually pick up. These are some of the tools that were used by the men And uh, I don't know. I just I just think it's it's really really amazing what humans are capable of doing to each other when when they think that the other one is an animal. So one thing that was really, really catching for me at the museum was when they explained 
that they had a buddy system for every man. So every man had a friend and he was his buddy and they would take care of one another. And that's the main reason that most of them testify that they are alive today is because their buddy helped them out when they were sick and they helped their buddy out when they were sick. And so I just think that's such a powerful testament and something that as humans we have to have. We have to have one another to survive terrible, terrible situations such as these. Man, walking down this trail, it's really amazing that these guys were not only working like 12 to 14 hour days in this heat, but that they, they were doing it without clothes. Most of their clothes had rotted off and their shoes as well. So they were walking around barefoot on this stuff. It's tons and tons of sharp rocks like this. And you can, you can see the pathway. I mean, I just, oh my gosh. When I walk on this stuff for two minutes, my feet quit on me. <laughs> you know, it's just totally wild what people can endure and what people have endured. It's amazing. So as you can see behind me here, there is a, a beautiful view. And according to the information on the tour, there was a water tower that you could see in the distance before and the men would walk by here on their way to their camp. <clears throat> and it says that the natural beauty of this place was one of the only things that kept them alive. And the water tower over there was where the Japanese kept most of their supplies. And if you can actually see on the video, behind me there's some big mountains in the distance. And I wish that the video could capture just how beautiful this place is because it is gorgeous. But those mountains, right past it, is Burma, Myanmar, today. Truly a magnificent view. And it's interesting because right behind me there's this huge drop off. And uh, I imagine that's probably where a good majority of the, the dead bodies were thrown. So they encourage you to take a walkie-talkie if you're going to do the long trek. And they say it's like an hour to get to the first part. So at least I thought that they meant it would take an hour to get there and then an hour to get back. But they were really saying like an hour round trip at most. So I walked there, got to the first point in like 15 minutes. But I didn't think that I was going to go further than that. So I didn't take a walkie-talkie with me. And then I was like, you know what? It's really not that bad. Like, if it's only another hour to get to the actual camps where the guys are, I'll just go. But now, I'm hearing noises in the jungles. And I'm out here in the jungle. <laughs> I'm out here totally alone. There might be some killer monkeys. Oh, I should have taken that stupid walkie-talkie with me. The thing that really scares me is that it's like, they say that all the tigers are gone, but I personally know of a guy who was seeing wild tigers up here up north like 15, 20 years ago. So, yeah, it's a little bit freaky, especially with all this long tall grass and my cell phone doesn't have reception which that was another thing I was thinking as I was like oh well worst case scenario I can just you know call them <sighs> well I met a friend her name's Shauna so we're walking walking to the end here and uh, luckily she has a walkie-talkie so if any <laughs> evil monkeys try to attack us at least we can let them know that we're dying so that's good <laughs> Just gonna keep on walking.
end of the trail. I thought that there would be some huts and stuff like that, like to see what the prisoners lived in, but it looks like the only the best they got is this bathroom right here. So maybe the guys lived in the bathroom, I'm not really sure. But it's time for us to head back and face these monkeys, I guess. So yeah. All right. Man, it's such an eerie feeling walking down here. Just randomly start got this song stuck in my head that I hadn't heard in so long. It was uh, it's that song. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. And I, then all of a sudden that kind of hit me. I was like, oh my gosh. Is this like my hearing like echoes from ghosts or something? I bet you 10 to 1 that they were, they might have been singing that song while they were working here. And God bless those guys. Can't imagine. Anyway, until next time, guys, please uh, subscribe to my channel. If you haven't yet, please do it. Yep, like the video, subscribe. It'd mean a whole lot. Thanks. Bye.